It's an honor for me to present at AUA to share my findings with you. To be clear, these are my own views and not and they do not represent the views of the Kalus School Banking Foundation, the London School of Economics, or any other organization. The English language version of this report is the version of record. The background to this project is the following. I've been conducting research in Armenia on civil society, NGOs, democracy building, and development since 1996. So this is not something new for me. But when I came in 2011, my aim was to look at what has happened to civil society um, 20 years after independence. And what surprised me was the amount of new groups, civic initiatives, that had emerged. Because initially, when I first began my dissertation research, it was predominantly the field of civil society in Armenia. It was predominantly covered by NGOs. So I began to investigate this and to research it, to try to understand the new developments in civil society and the implications they have for society. Five quest um, several questions um, are addressed in this report. The first is, what factors have led to the rise of civic initiatives in Armenia? What are the environmental civic initiatives in particular attempting to achieve? What direct and indirect impacts have they had? And in this sense, I'm going beyond the productivist view, meaning I'm not looking simply at policy level changes, but the broader changes. And finally, what lessons can be learned from global experience? Because I will be speaking later in this talk about mining, and mining is a global phenomenon which has been opposed, again, globally. So what, what can we understand? So I'm going to talk initially about civil society, and then I'm going to turn to development, environmental activism, and mining. Um, this was, just to give you some background about the research, um, it was this report is based on 82 individual interviews with the following stakeholder groups, including activists, NGO representatives, villagers living near mining areas, and um, the other stakeholders. Interestingly, um, despite our efforts, no one from the Ministry um, of Natural Resources would speak to us. We also conducted 16 focus groups in various towns and cities and villages across Armenia, including Tehul, Denshanov, mm -hmm. and Alaverdi. Because they wouldn't speak to us, we consulted their websites and publications. Um, I would also like to thank Transparency International Anti-Corruption Center for facilitating a freedom of information request um, about mine ownership, which we'll present in, 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 subsequently in this talk. And I also conducted extensive literature review, and there's nine pages of citations in the book, so in case anyone is interested, everything is referenced. So I'm going to now talk about civil society. And initially, we, I think we need to begin with a definition. So we are all talking about the same thing. I want to thank Alan for his discussion of civil society. I think this is one of the most hotly debated areas of what is civil society. But I'll give you a very short definition. And this is that, the one that my colleagues and I developed um, several years ago. And that is, civil society is an arena of uncoerced collective action around shared interests, purposes, and values. The key word in that sentence is uncoerced. So things like Nashi in Russia, which emerged a few years ago, or when we see individuals coming on behalf of an oligarch, that's not necessarily uncoerced. So I think it's important to focus on that. The second is, of course, you know, civil society is not something new. It's the Greeks talked about it, the Romans talked about it. It was important during the Enlightenment. It was seen in opposition to the state as a balancing power 
and from Hegel to Kant to Adam Ferguson and so forth. I'm not going to go into that too deeply. But I just want to point out that the concept itself was really discovered in the late 20th century, both in academia but also in the real world. In the real world, in particular in Eastern Europe, but also in Latin America, what we saw was the rise of activist movements, social movements, the Velvet Revolutions, where they began to challenge the living alive, and they were very much influenced by Gramsci and his ideas of civil society as a space to challenge hegemony. Once the donors got a hold of this concept and the neoliberals, they began to instrumentalize it and co-opt it and, and this had a very interesting impact on civil society because once you begin to try to control it and to tame it, then it becomes something entirely different. But influenced by the ideas of de Tocqueville, um, neo Tocquevillians such as I will mention Robert Putnam, Francis Fukuyama, and others, saw civil society as a counterpoint to the state. And so what's interesting is that Armenia has lived through all of these. It had the activist period in the late 80s. It's gone through the neoliberal instrumentalization. And now we're coming to a new phase. Before I talk about that, it's also important to look at the 21st century and how things are changing. We talk about the civil society 2.0 and the impact of social media. And I think it's important to think about social media very critically. I don't agree with those who are um, uncritical of social media and they only see the possibilities because it's important to remember that it can also be used for surveillance and provocation. So if we look at civil society in Armenia from the 1980s to the present, I see three distinct phases of development. So the first phase I'm putting 1987 to 1990, I see that as an organic, nascent development. So it was some, the seeds of civil society. And Levon Abrahamian will talk more about that, so I'm not going to speak too much about that period. The period that I've studied a lot was the post-Soviet period, 1991 to 2006. And what I've written about is the genetically engineered civil society, which I argue, for instance, if you take a tomato and you insert a lot of hormones, it's going to go to the size of a watermelon. And this is what we saw in Armenia, where Armenian NGOs went from being 40, 44 registered in 1994 to over 1,500 in 1996. How did this happen? So I think we have to look at that impact, and it, that, that impact continues. It was top-down, donor-driven, and for some it was an alternative form of employment. But as a new generation has grown, we see the rise of a different type of civil society, the emergence of civic initiatives, which are more bottom up, which are more connected to some of the real life issues. And to be clear, I'm not saying that NGOs are not addressing real life issues, they are. But it's slightly different here. And there's a less dependence on donors. So what are civic initiatives? In the report, we try to define civic initiatives. And one of the ways that we talk about them is that they are far more horizontal, volunteer-based, much more focused on issues um, at a very specific level, and that even if they are interested in the specific, they are being driven by a concern with the lack of democracy, with the rise of oligarchic capitalism in Armenia, and corruption and other injustices in the country. So it's very important to look at civic initiatives. Why are they emerging is a more complicated question. I think there is definitely a generational aspect. The generation of young people that was born in the late Soviet period or in the early 1990s who has never lived through the Soviet period personally, they play a very important role. And they also don't have the experience of living in a welfare state. So they have no expectations that the state is going to provide anything for them. So it becomes much more self-sufficient. Social media I've already mentioned but I think, again, um, we, we have to be careful. You know, there's a lot of clicktivism, liking things on Facebook, but not then following through. So I think there is that danger of over kind of selling that story. But of course, that has played an important role in creating a space and a platform for debate and discussion. And finally, I think there has to be some kind of global element. Because when we see what's happening in Armenia, we see the rise emerging in the late 2000s, so around 2008, 2010, and so forth, and this coincides with the global rise of activism. And I think there has to be some connection. We are living in a global world. So whether it's Greece, Chile, Egypt, England, or 
any of these other countries, there is that sense of disillusionment with participatory democracy, the demand for real democracy and representation, the demand for social justice, and the demand for dignity, which is very, very important. In the sense, in Armenia, not Arjana Pakutun, in the patriarchal sense of the word, but in the sense that you don't live a life where you're feeling humiliated by those who claim to be above the law. So I think it's very, very important. And my research has looked at civil society globally, and I do see Armenia within that global context and what's happening. So what we did um, as part of this research was to try to map the civic initiative. This is a partial graph. The full graph is in the, in the publication itself. So we looked at the, the initiative, what issues they were addressing, when they began, the location and the status. Was it successfully resolved? Is it continuing? So forth. The first civic initiative, and what I'm going to be talking about significantly in my talk, is the Safe Table Civic Initiative. Created in 2007, it was the first. And subsequently, we have others, including um, the Gyumri based civic initiative around taxi drivers' rights, Merkavaka, Tachkan, and others. They're all listed here. And what we found, unsurprisingly, is that figure two shows there is an overwhelming presence of Yerevan based civic initiatives and Yerevan based activists. I don't think this comes to a surprise to anyone. So 80% of civic initiatives were based in Yerevan, and the other 17% were a mix. And this is significant, because this means that what's happening in Yerevan isn't being necessarily translated. And we traveled around the country, and in fact, there are places where you find very little civic activism, and moreover, people are very, very afraid, even of speaking to us. Moreover, in terms of civic initiatives and issues that they were targeting, ecology was one of um, 34 percent, coupled with cultural preservation and human rights. So these are the issues that concern people today in Armenia. And it's important to see how these develop. What is going to be the outcome? And I think we can talk about preliminary outcomes and impacts rather than, you know, this is the end of the story. So some of the preliminary outcomes have been indeed policy changes. There have been successes. Marshall's Park, Tarchkan, the maternity leave law, Zaruhi Bedrosyan, the, the civic uh, initiative around getting a trial for the murderer. There has been awareness raising of issues. The fact that I am here today and that you are here today is the success of the civic activists who are working on different issues. The fact that we are talking about these issues. So there has been greater awareness, not just in Armenia, but I would add in diaspora as well. There has been a rise of social capital. Sadly, it's been mostly bonding, meaning groups within are connecting, but not necessarily reaching out. Although I think this has started to a certain extent, but perhaps there has to be a bit more of that linking and bridging in order to go beyond the 80% Yerevan activism. And of course, there is a sense of responsibility emerging, ownership and active citizenship. And that term, or the phrase, the time of the self-determined citizen, I think it's very significant, that sense of citizenship, that sense of having rights and defending those rights by quoting law, by basing oneself on the constitution of, our, of the Republic of Armenia. So these are all very important. Now, before I turn to the development and environmental activism, I just want to conclude this section by saying, why is civil society important? Well, in general, it's important because it creates that space within which we can reflect and think about whether the status quo is what we want or we want to change it. It's that space from which individuals and groups who share interests can hold governments and corporations to account, naming and shaming bad practices and abuses. And third, it creates inclusive institutions where people feel part of the system, feel part of the country rather than marginalized, and that they are not taken, and that they are not respected, and they don't live a life of dignity. Around environmental issues, um, civil society, not just in Armenia, but globally, has played a very important role, opening up debate about the impact of mining, about the impact of these different processes raising questions about the strategies, and trying to include all types of stakeholders 
and to make those voices heard where they were not heard. And I think this is very important. I'm going to turn now to the second part. I'm starting the discussion from a global perspective and then going to Armenia. Mining, in general, since the 1980s, has moved from the global north to the global south. Why? One of the reasons is that foreign investors are seeking to increase their comparative advantage. So they are attracted by less stringent environmental policies and regulatory frameworks. And as Glenn Quecker has argued, reformed mining codes in many countries, including Armenia, are profoundly undemocratic and at times allow multinational corporations to operate in ways that would be considered in the global north. And I think this is very significant because the upgrading has been done to make these mining friendly policies is shown as to be a way of increasing um, kind of the growth. But what is the impact I think needs to be asked. So we can see the reason of why this is, why mining has started to move from the global north to the global south. Globally, the debates around mining have focused on two areas, where the proponents or the supporters of mining argue that they are creating jobs and growth and development. Those who oppose mining, whether it be indigenous peasants, whether it be workers, whoever it is, civil society activists, have pointed to the resource curse or the Dutch disease. And research has shown that since the 1980s, countries that are mineral rich have, out, have underperformed their mineral poor neighbors. This means that in mineral rich countries we find more inequality, more corruption, more rent seeking, the short term focus rather than the long term focus of development, there are dangers of over-reliance on mining in their case studies discussed in the report. And this is what some people have called the paradox of mineral wealth, that you have mineral wealth, but and yet there's poverty and there is not growth. So this is very important. Mining in Armenia, well, we have to take the long-term view. So in the Soviet period, it was, of course, run by the state, the central state in Moscow, and also by Yerevan. In 1999, the privatization process begins, and a decade later, by 2011, mining has become one of the significant sectors of the Armenian economy. By some estimates, it's 50% or more. So there is a significant level of production and increase of mining activity. And yet, despite being 50% of the economy, and what the mining journal, the mining journal is the leading industry journal, um, says there are significant revenue gains, there continues to be high levels of poverty in Armenia, unemployment, emigration, people continue to leave the country, there is environmental impact and public health risks. So where is the benefit needs to be asked that question. And there's a lack of accountability in decision-making processes. Participatory mechanisms are weak. And what we find with the newly reformed mining code is the emphasis on the mining friendly. So, um, so what we find, this is um, a map that was prepared by Lena Nazarian from the Transparency International Anti-Corruption Center NGO. There are 670 identified mines in Armenia. 439 of those 670 have been granted exploitation licenses. 413 are non-metallic mines, and 26 are metallic mines. So if you look at the map, and um, you can look at this online as well, the entire country is covered with mining sites. What does this mean? And this is not only mining sites, but we also have the tailing dumps where the waste goes. And so I think this is very, very important to look at it in this way and to consider the impact that all of this is going to have on the environment and public health. And yet, the government continues to pursue a very mining-friendly policy. This is a direct quote, and I'm going to read this. 
This is the foreword to the Mining Industry in Armenia 2011 report. And the person being quoted is Mr. Armin Movsisyan, the Ministry, Minister of Energy and Natural Resources. He states, to quote, Today, Armenia as an independent state is ready to meet the global demand for metals and minerals. With the mineral and mining industry such an important sector of Armenia, it is important for our country to maintain its mining-friendly status. In order to maintain and enhance the status, the Armenian government is upgrading the legislative framework for the country's mining sector with the help of the World Bank and the European experts. Two things I would ask everyone to remember is, number one, the focus on mining friendly, and the second, that this legislative framework was upgraded with the help of World Bank and European experts. So every time I hear you know, the phrase coming from critics that the activists are pursuing the goals of foreigners, I would like to ask them to also reflect on this, and, what, and I wonder whether the World Bank and European experts are ethnic Armenians. <laughs> So what is mining-friendly legislation? Well, mining-friendly legislation and the 2012 Mining Code have two important factors that we need to look at. Of course, before the Mining Code was even upgraded, the, you know, the mining-friendly legislation existed. The first, lenient taxation system, no restrictions on the conversion or repatriation of capital and earnings, so the money is free to flow out of the country. No limitations on wire transfers of money. Building on this to make it even more mining friendly, the code was upgraded in 2012, and what we saw first was the removal ex of the exploitation fee. Already this fee, the, the fee that corporations would have to pay to take the minerals out of the ground, was one of the lowest in the world. It was 1.3% to 1.5%, where countries like Canada are much higher, around 15%. So this was removed. So now, corporations don't have to pay to take minerals out of the ground. All they have to pay is the royalty, which is calculated based on the sale price of the minerals. And as activists argue, this creates serious corruption risks. Because if you wish to minimize the tax basis, you will sell it at a lower price than the market rate. So I think this has to be taken into account. The second is, that on the 2012 Law on Rates for Environmental Protection, we find seven categories of waste, four of which are classified as hazardous wastes. Those most hazardous come with a 48,000 Armenian gram rate of payment. Under the new legislation, interestingly, the word waste has been eliminated and replaced with this amorphous, ununderstandable word, incomprehensible word called litzakuit, which basically is translated into heaps or pile of rocks. What this essentially means, and I'm putting Hagop Sarian, is that wastes created as a result of mining are not taxed. Legislation registers the tax for one ton of waste at zero drum. So what this essentially means is that this frees corporations from responsibility of maintaining the tailing ponds. And essentially, this is the privatization of gain and profit and the socialization of costs. So the money is taken out, but the country gets stuck with the rubbish. So one of the other things that we wanted to understand was about ownership and who owns the mines. <coughs> this was a very challenging exercise because we did the freedom of information requests and as we state in the report, um, we got varying sources from two government offices. So then we went online and tried to trace and see what's going on, who owns it. So we have several columns here. One is the name of the mine. The second column is the who owns the, the mine exploitation license. So who can take the things out of the ground. But then there's all these mining companies that are shareholders. And here you begin to see where the, all the confusion arises because there's companies registered in Guinea, there's companies registered in the British Virgin Islands, there's companies registered in Cyprus, China. So from an accountability perspective, who should be held to account? God forbid something goes wrong. And I think this is a very important question. Who is responsible? And in interestingly enough, for some of the mining sites, there's not even any information at all available about them. So 
this is a very important question of why is this not so transparent? And the last column that I would ask you to look at, which is entirely the same, all the way from up and down, is the 0% column, which is the shares that the state owns. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the metallic mines, the state as the state, and not representatives or politicians of the state, own 0%. So essentially, um, the question is, who benefits? And that's why I ask the question of costs and benefits. And again, if we speak to mining corporations, they justify their advantages given to their sector. They justify the min mining friendly policies by arguing that they are creating jobs, that they are engaging in corporate social responsibility, that they are um, supporting infrastructure development and charity. And the above is a, um, a photograph I took in Ala Verde, where you have the smokestack in the back and the church that was built by Valery Mejlumian, who owns 19.3% of. Um, the Tebut mine. And I've been teaching um, NGOs and development and so, uh, social policy and development for 10 years now. And one of the things we cover in our courses is corporate social responsibility. I know that it's very popular among donor communities. But I would like to quote Milton Friedman, the godfather of neoliberal economics. And this is what he has to say that the business of business is to generate profit to pay your taxes, the correct rate of taxes, and your fair wages to your employees. It's not your business to be socially responsible. Because essentially, he says, when you're claiming to be socially responsible but doing all of these other things, avoiding taxes, you're simply being hypocritical. And some of this approach is fraud. So he holds them in high disdain and contempt. And you can read that article from the New York Times to see what he says. So I think while corporate so social responsibility is not necessarily as bad as Milton Friedman describes it, I don't think it should <laughs> take the place of other forms of development. It, and it sh and I am very skeptical of charity. I believe development should be based on rights and not charity and the goodwill of individuals. Environmental and activism in Armenia. Turning to that. So, of course, taking the long view, this is nothing new. In the mid-1980s, there was activism around environmental issues in Armenia, and I'm not going to speak about that too much um, because Professor Abrahamian will discuss it. But what's interesting is that after the Soviet period, there was this set sense that environmentalists had somehow contributed to the crisis. And so the ecolog name became very much um, maligned. And so what I argue in the report is that 2005 was an important, the Shigahok action was very important because it, it led to some extent to the rehabilitation of the concept of environmental activism. And from that we begin to see the rise of the Tehut movement and other movements. So I'm going to be focusing on from 2006 to now. And of course these are the different, you know, there has been activism by NGOs, which wasn't necessarily taken very forward around Tehut particularly. Um, I'll, make, I'll, I'll speak about that a bit more. Um, the Safe Tehut Civic Initiative has played a very important role since 2007. And the newly created Pan-Armenian Environmental Front, which was created in January of this year, is also trying to raise the issues, not just throughout Armenia, but in diaspora communities as well. So why Tehut? The Tehut Copper and Melibedin Mine is in one of the last pristine forests in Armenia, which is rich in biodiversity. The mine will cover 82% of forested land. And of course, it's going to create some waste products, even if it's not defined as waste. And this is serious concerns. Now, civil society organizations have raised the issue around a variety of elements. The first being around the environmental impact assessment that was conducted. And the critique of that was that it was conducted by the Lerna Metallurgia Institute, which belongs to Valex, which also owns the mine. So the question of independence comes to the forefront. So there have been arguments um, that the mine was grossly undervalued, and in some cases, the environmental impact assessment was inaccurately compiled. There's also the matter, as I showed with that chart, of who owns 80.7% 
there is the offshore registration, which is unclear. Who owns that? So again, back to the question of transparency and accountability. But more than that, I mean, Tebut is not the largest mine. It wasn't the first mine in Armenia. But as many people that I interviewed said, it was a Borna Sharain Kantir. It is a fundamental issue. It encompasses all that is problematic in Armenia, including corruption, economic injustice, and inequitable mining policies. And so I think the focus of activists has become Tebut, but it isn't only Tebut because there are many other mines. But we can't forget the fact that you have 439 mines and small groups of activists. Now, before I get into the discussion, we have to recognize that there is always going to be, within civil society, a spectrum of forms and types of engagement. This is the various types of ways in which civil society organizations promote corporate accountability, from direct action all the way to cooperative action. So in terms of direct action, there is confrontation with companies, lawsuits against companies, boycotts. Towards the middle, we have media and public awareness, socially pub responsible investment, all the way to this side where we find partnership, dialogue, and alliances. And in Armenia, we also see the spectrum of different types of civil society organizations taking different strategic stances. And I would argue that it's important to have that diversity. You need the people inside, sitting around the table, but you also need those shouting outside. So the Save Table Civic Initiative, which was founded in 2007, is, according to their website, guided by principles enshrined in the Constitution of Armenia, calling for healthy and dignified life, freedom, prosperity, and the happiness of generations. And for this reason, they talk about the long-term impacts of the mine. They cite corruption, uncontrolled over-exploitation and profit-making from natural resources, and the unfair distribution of wealth. And they argue that all of this is leading to mass emigration. So this is very important. And they've tried to raise the issue over the past five, six years through protest actions, boycotts, lawsuits, petitions, educational campaigns, as well as more recently alternative development strategies, including the sale of honey, agricultural products, organic agricultural products, and knitwear and other items. So I think it's a bevy of strategies trying to indicate that mining is not the only way forward. But of course, when you speak to villagers, sometimes some argue mine charming. So there is that. We, we cannot discount the fact that jobs are important, employment is important, but is mining the only employment possible? In addition to the Safe Tehrut Initiative, um, other actors are involved. Of course, several NGOs. Um, some NGOs are reluctant. Um, they don't want to engage, and I discuss this in the report. But there are others who are, have put their names to the petitions, who have signed documents, who have engaged together with the activists in the lawsuits and other actions. And I think this is very important because to some extent, NGOs are much more constrained because they are registered, because they have um, different sources um, of accountability to maintain. But they are working with the activists. And what's also very important is when we talk about civic initiatives, it's also important to remember that many NGO employees are involved in the civic initiatives in their individual personal capacity as karakatis, as citizens. So sometimes, you know, this divorcing of the categories is not actually factual. But I think some NGOs are out there, Ecoera, um, the Transparency, Helsinki, there are different organizations. But others have perhaps been much more cautious for a variety of reasons. Political parties, interestingly, have been largely silent, um, apart from individuals within political parties. But I don't want to focus on that today so much in my talk, but really focus on the diaspora. Because I've lived in the diaspora. I am a diaspora Armenian. And it's very interesting because sometimes when I listen to activists in the interviews, there's this sense that diaspora is a monolithic entity. And I want to point out that actually there's quite a lot of diversity within the diaspora. So of course we have Serge Tankyan here with Mariam Sukhudyan and Haral Savzyan. And he's been a staunch advocate of Tehut and other environmental causes in Armenia. But not every diasporan is concerned. People are concerned with their own lives and their own problems. 
some are still afraid. I know people called me before I came and said, Aman, skush kallas. So it's gush and um, And some are still focused on writing the injustices of the past. My grandparents on both sides were genocide survivors. I think this is fundamentally important, but I hope that we will also look at the injustices of the present. And we cannot forget or ignore the fact that some diasporans think that mining is good. And not only do they think that it's good, they support it, and they are in leadership positions within mining corporations. So. This is a spectrum of diasporans. We all are not the same. And I think we have to maintain that sense of diversity and find that way of speaking to the diaspora and the dialogue between Armenians in Armenia and Armenians in the diaspora. And there are organizations that have been created, including Green Armenia, including um, the Building Alternative Futures organization in Geneva that are doing good work. And so I think it's important to recognize that. Coming to an end, um, I think there have been achievements. As I said, the fact that we are all here and talking about these issues, um, it has raised awareness, there's increased public scrutiny. We are thinking about alternative paths to development, but we cannot be blind to the challenges including the enormous power imbalances between civil society and corporations and political and economic elites. Fear, this was something that we found through our focus groups where people were very afraid that they would lose their jobs or there would be other forms of repression. There's apathy and lack of ownership over issues like, that has nothing to do with me. I think I've got lots of you. And of course people need jobs, so you have to take that into consideration. And I think this is very important. So, to conclude, I think there are several points that I want to leave you with. First of all, I want to argue that we need to think about balance. You have to talk about environmental issues alongside growth. It's not just about jobs and short-term growth, but it's about the longer impact. So we have to look at justice and the just sustainability approach. As um, Alena Mekhanyan mentioned, I do cite Asimoglu and Robinson's work on inclusive institutions of why certain nations fail and others succeed because of the inclusive institutions where people feel part of the system. I think reforms are urgently needed to go from being a mining friendly country to being people and environmental friendly as well. And I finally think that civil society is important. It's opened up the issue, but it cannot act alone that it needs to be supported. So perhaps the place to start is to have this debate and the discussion about the policies, the laws, and to think about being in people and environmentally type of country. Thank you for your attention.